words to lawmakers shortly. But first, my partner Natasha Williams is at the state capitol. It's where all this is happening. She has a preview. The 85 day session is underway. Governor John Bell Edwards speaking to the House and Senate to outline what his agenda will be and giving an overview of where things stand in the next four years of his term. More than 1,100 bills have been filed by lawmakers for debate. Taxes can't be considered. All other topics, though, are wide open. With term limits wiping out many of the previous lawmakers, this legislative session will look very different. Dozens of new members with lots of topics for debate, but none of the budget issues that took up so much of the time last term. The 105-member House has 45 new members, including two former senators. The 39-member Senate includes 20 new faces, 10 of them moving from House seats. Lawmakers will consider whether to legalize sports betting, recreational marijuana, whether to do away with Louisiana's use of the death penalty or change the way they execute. Also, how to spend the multi-million dollar surplus and how to deal with some of the highest car insurance rates in the country. Now, Governor Edwards' agenda will be largely focused on spending proposals, including more money for public colleges, K-12 schools, and early childhood education. But first, Edwards and lawmakers must agree on a revenue forecast to determine how much money the state will spend. Now, this session will end June 1st at 6 o'clock. Of course, we'll be here throughout the term to tell you exactly what's going on here in the Senate and the House during this legislative session. Reporting from the Capitol, Natasha Williams. Andre, back to you. Natasha, thanks so much for that. And here with me to break down the needs, the hopes, the expectations of uh, this three-month session is the president of Council for a Better Louisiana Cable, of course, Barry Irwin. And uh, a lot of new faces, a lot of new things, but it's... Uh, the same legislature, just with new faces in it. Huh? It is. I mean, a lot of the issues are going to be familiar. I mean, you just heard Natasha talking about ones we've heard, medical marijuana, I mean, recreational marijuana, sports betting, those types of things. That's going to be something that we've seen before. I think the big wrinkle that's going to be different this year is that there's going to be a big effort towards tort reform or a reform of the civil litigation system. We've had some of that before in the past, but the legislature was such that it never really went anywhere. This is a year where I think you're going to be hearing a lot about tort, whether you know what that means right, or not. Exactly, we and will learn. It, we will learn a lot about it, but the intent is to try and lower insurance rates, and we'll have a, a pretty uh, healthy debate over that as we go forward. One thing that's been interesting is that the, the new leaders of the legislature, um, and I've interviewed them a couple mm -hmm. times, they seem very friendly, they seem very open, uh, they've sort of dissuaded any chance that there will be friction between them and the governor, whether that happens or not remains to be seen. Well, it's nice that they're off to a very yeah. friendly start. And actually, you know, in years past, because of the makeup of the House and the Senate being a little bit different philosophically, the Senate more aligned with the governor, the House less so, you, you saw some contention between the two chambers. And a lot of it was about the budget, but then it, it spilled off into other issues as well. I think what the leadership is trying to say is that we don't want to do that anymore. We want to have a good working relationship between our two bodies, our two chambers. We want to get the budget over there in a timely fashion, other bills over there and that sounds great at the beginning <laughs> we'll see how long it holds it, it sounds like smart business it does you mentioned the budget of course the revenue estimating uh, conference it's not been established yet and on this day uh, things are tumbling in stocks and in oil prices so that yeah that could play a factor in this i think that's definitely going to be another wrinkle that's really important to watch we don't have the budget issues like we had in the past because of you know the the cliff the fiscal cliff and all that we've got revenues from there but the the impact of uh, really plummeting oil prices will have a difference uh, make a difference on our budget especially since there are a lot of investments that i know the governor is going to talk about that he would like to make in higher education k-12 education early childhood um that's the extra Extra money, and if we're losing dollars because of plummeting oil prices and the impact on our economy, that's where it'll probably come out. Uh, you can bet that the governor will be talking about much of that stuff in his address, yeah. uh, which should be beginning uh, just any minute uh, from the state capitol. Um, until it does, we'll keep you posted. We'll be talking. And uh, interesting, uh, I attended the Restore Louisiana event uh, last week yeah. at the UL Lafayette, and great timing, of course, and and really a smart, great push 
uh, to see if some of the things that need to be done to move Louisiana up the ratings right. uh, across the board uh, can begin to take hold with this legislature. Well, I think we heard some encouraging things from the legislators that were there and the leadership. Um, there were like four big issues in that agenda that were really major ones. One was education, the other was infrastructure, state fiscal policies, and criminal justice reform. I think in this session you'll probably hear mostly about two of those, education, mm -hmm. because the governor's put quite a bit of that into his budget, and there are a lot of bills filed on criminal justice reform to try and deal with some of those issues and continue implementation of some of the policies that we've already put in place. Uh, the other ones, infrastructure, you know, you may be talking about gasoline tax, that's not something we can do this year. Right. Um, trying to change the tax structure, that's not something we can do this year. So I'm kind of seeing some um, some conversations about all of those, but probably the bigger push this session would be on education and, and also on those criminal justice pieces. Something that's frustrating about the infrastructure issue is that you can talk about it, but yeah. I mean, you know, talking about it doesn't mean it can start the next day. That just begins the process of building something, which can take years. Well, and the other part is, I mean, there's pretty broad consensus that the issue that we have, it is a function of money. I mean, that's yeah. really what it is. Other things you can say, well, it's not money, it's not money. Well, in this case, it is. You have to have the money to build the roads, to, to put a bridge in here, or one in Lake Charles, wherever that may be. And so the, the task is, okay, where do we find the additional revenues? Now, there will be some proposals this session to try and take some existing revenues that we have and move those into the Transportation Trust Fund. But when you do that, you create a budget gap somewhere else, and we'll just see how far that goes. Otherwise, you're probably talking about taxes, and that would be a next year issue. It, or uh, it, any other kind of creative financing that financing would tolls. be looked at? Tolls, I mean, right. they're, they're at some point, you have to um, you have to bite the bullet and do it. Do something to make something happen, or else you find yourself sort of one of the slogans of Restore Louisiana: <laughs> uh, doing nothing and it, nothing happens nothing when you happens wait. When you wait, right? Exactly. exactly. And uh, so I mean, that's uh, not the thing to do, obviously. And, and um, again, a great push from well, thanks your your program uh, along with. Uh, uh, the, the other Public uh, Affairs Research yeah. Council and uh, Committee of 100. We kind of worked on that a lot during the election year, and I will say we got a lot of traction out of it. I think you heard, and I think you'll still hear today, uh, a lot of those issues talked about because they're really just fundamental issues that are important to our state. The Barriers you watch live right now, Governor John Bell Edwards is now moving into uh, the center aisle where he will uh, eventually move to the podium along with his wife Donna and address the session of the legislature and a lot of smiling faces. I was going to say, huh? a lot more smiles than <laughs> wow. you've seen in some of these sessions that we've had in the past. Yeah, <laughs> and, and a quick stride up uh, there also. He's, he's not walking too slowly, it seems like. Uh, the colors are being uh, time, presented Michael by Jay, the Youth Challenge Program uh, today. will lead us in prayer. Please remain standing for the presentation of the colors, the Pledge of Allegiance, and the National Anthem. And of course, we'll hear a prayer first. Lord God, we gather this day asking your guidance upon our governor and elected officials as they begin another session. These women and men come as representatives of the people from across our great state. We pray, Lord, that you may guide their conversations and grant them wisdom to represent the needs of all. Lord, in these divided times, may our leaders be examples of civil discourse and mutual respect. May they operate from a basis of principles and not partisanship, advancing interests that benefit all Louisianians. We recall that our Lord called upon his disciples, called them together and said, whoever wants to be great among you must be servant and whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. May our faithful representatives spend their days working for the common good, protecting all life and humbly serving. May the gifts of the Spirit come down upon you, remain with you, and may your words and actions daily mirror the words and actions of our Savior. Lord God, we entrust these, our representatives, into your loving embrace. Protect them, guide them, lead them as they lead our great state. Lord, may they use their voices 
to speak for those who have no voice. May they use their lives to serve all. Bless us all and bless our great state today and each day. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Louisiana National Guard Youth Challenge Program Gillis W. Long Center will present the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor Rodney Grogan of Patterson will now sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. All the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets reckless, the bombs bursting in air, gave that our flag was still there. Oh, say thus that star-spangled banner yet wave. Oh, the land of the free and the home of the We ask that you please remain standing till the color guard exits. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the great state of Louisiana, the Honorable John Bell Edwards. Thank you. I want to thank the Youth Challenge Program for posting the colors today and Father Lello for the prayer. Thank you very much. Mayor Grogan. Wonderful job on the national anthem. Mr. Speaker and Mr. President, members of the legislature and distinguished guests, today is not only the start of a new regular session, it is the beginning of a new chapter for Louisiana. For myself, obviously, it's the start of my second term as your governor, during which time I will continue to put Louisiana first and advance priorities that are important to the people of our state. For you, today marks the beginning of a legislature that looks a little different than it did just a year ago. And as I look across the room, I see many familiar faces who've worked with me over the past four years to put Louisiana on the right track. But I also see many new faces. So to all of the new members, I want to welcome you and your families today. 
And my pledge to you and to every member is that I am ready to work with all of you in good faith to set aside partisan division and continue to move Louisiana forward. And I'm happy to say that Louisiana is much stronger today than she was four years ago, precisely because we were able to rise above partisanship. There are a lot of people in this chamber today and even more watching. And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to update you on Louisiana's response to COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. Just minutes ago, while I was on a conference call with Vice President Mike Pence about the coronavirus, I learned that we have a presumptive positive case here in Louisiana, a Jefferson Parish resident who was hospitalized in Orleans Parish. It still has to be confirmed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Understand, however, that we are treating this as a positive case, and this confirmation process will not slow us down from taking any necessary actions to continue monitoring and preventing the spread of this virus. I have promised that we would be transparent about this, and we will. Later this afternoon, I will be joined by public health officials for a news conference to answer questions. Now, together, all of us, as a government, health care systems, providers, schools, businesses, neighbors, we must take action and be vigilant to prevent the spread of this virus in our great state. Now is the time for seriousness. There is no place for panic or hysteria. The novel coronavirus and preventing the spread of illness has been an increased focus over the past weeks and months as we see more cases pop up all over the country. In response, I launched a task force that is leading the planning effort for different scenarios involving COVID-19, and our state agencies have been coordinating with the federal government and with each other to ensure that we are preparing for and responding to this public health threat appropriately. As legislators, one of the most important things you can do to help is to share accurate information with your constituents about the current threat in Louisiana, which still remains low, and the proper way to avoid spreading illness, including hand washing, coughing into your elbow, avoiding unnecessary handshaking and physical contact, and certainly staying home when you are sick. One of the biggest questions that people have across the country is about testing. In Louisiana, we've completed 15 tests so far at the state's public health lab. 14 are negative, and one is positive, as I just mentioned. We've recently received two additional test kits from the CDC and have the capacity for several hundred tests. For our tests, we're working within the CDC's guidelines to test three groups of people those who have traveled to certain areas and have symptoms, those who have had close contact with a person confirmed to have COVID-19 and showed their own symptoms, and finally, those with an acute respiratory illness that cannot be explained. While we in most states had limited testing capacity at the start of this process, we should see commercial testing go live across the country and here in Louisiana this week. Commercial testing means that more people who are sick will be able to talk to their health care providers about their risk and if they need to be tested, and that is certainly a good thing. Our role at the state will be to take any test that is presumed positive by a commercial lab and then to verify it at the state public health lab before sending it to the CDC for confirmation. This verification will be very important as these commercial tests come online. Let me be clear. We will immediately take action on any positive test out of an abundance of caution while waiting for confirmation from the CDC. And yes, we will still be announcing any additional presumptively positive cases to the public. For anyone who is presumed positive, we will also be completing what epidemiologists call contact tracing to make sure we are assessing the risk to the people who have come into contact with them and completing additional testing to prevent the spread. We do encourage anyone who is sick to seek advice from a medical provider. We also strongly recommend people avoid going out in public if they are sick. 
Regardless of if a person has the coronavirus or the flu, we must all be vigilant to prevent the spread of illness in our communities. You know, there are many things that I love about Louisiana, but our ability to work together when times are tough is certainly at the top of the list. I am confident in the men and women who are working each and every day to prevent the spread of this illness. I am grateful for anyone who plays a role in this response, and I'm praying for the health and safety of the people of Louisiana, and I encourage you to join me by lifting up your own prayers. So now back to today in the opening of the legislative session. We have the opportunity to improve the lives of Louisiana working families like never before. At my inauguration, I talked about my overarching goals for a second term. And today I want to talk about specific ways we can achieve those goals. It begins where everything begins, with education. The budget that I have proposed to you makes new strategic investments in education at every level. Now, when I talk about the following funding numbers, I am referring to the budget I proposed based on the most conservative estimate of the, of the Revenue Estimating Conference. Until the REC adopts an official forecast, these numbers are merely a proposal. That is why I'm urging the REC to adopt a forecast sooner rather than later so that we have as much time as possible this session to develop a responsible budget using real numbers based on the recommendation of our expert economists rather than on hypotheticals. As we've seen in the last 24 hours, we know that predicting the market and state revenue is a challenge. That's why it's important to listen to the economic experts, just as important to listen to them when it comes to adopting a forecast as it is to listen to our medical experts on how to prepare for and respond to the coronavirus. For 10 years, Louisiana disinvested in higher education. In fact, more than anywhere else in the country. And we suffered the consequences. For the next 10 years, let's commit to reinvesting in higher education in order to strengthen our state. We already have a blueprint for this, thanks to the Higher Education Master Plan, which aims to have 60% of working age adults earn an industry-based credential or a degree by 2030. One of the ways we're going to accomplish this is through making dual enrollment accessible to all Louisiana students. I've committed more than $30 million in my proposed budget for higher education, as well as fully funding TOPS and funding GO grants, need-based aid for higher education, at their highest level ever. Additionally, the budget proposal includes $39 million in new funding for K-12 education, and I am recommending that all of that $39 million be committed to an additional teacher pay raise. Let me make this very clear. Before the end of my second term, we will have raised teacher pay to at least the Southern Regional Average. We took the first step last year by giving educators and support workers their first raise in a decade, but we're not done. I know that it's going to take some time to fully recover from years of budget cuts and stagnant funding in education, but we need to demonstrate to students, to parents, and to educators that we are serious when we say we aren't going back. But we must do everything possible to make certain our children are ready for school from the very beginning. And that leads me to the number one priority when it comes to new education investments in my second term, early childhood education. At the governor's mansion, at the governor's mansion, I appreciate that, Donna. At the governor's mansion, there's an oak tree in the backyard with a plaque presented to Governor Mike Foster by the University of Louisiana system. It says on the plaque that a college education starts in preschool, and it ends with the saying, tall oaks from little acorns grow. In many ways, early childhood education is like the roots of that oak tree. It's the strong foundation for a lifetime of growth and opportunity and prosperity. That has certainly been the case for four-year-old Treasure Johnson, who started her educational journey at London Bridge Early Learning Center in Baton Rouge when she was just two years old. 
With the support of her parents and teachers, she began reading, writing, and spelling earlier than most toddlers her age, and has tested gifted and in intellectual abilities, mathematics, and reading. Her parents have stated that it was a blessing to be at a center that could meet her exactly where she was developmentally, and now at the age of four and soon to be five, they are confident that she has the tools that she needs to excel in any school she's accepted into. Treasurer is here today with her mom, Sierra Johnson, along with the owner of London Bridge Early Learning Center, Tara Emery. Would you all please stand to be recognized and thank you so much uh, for being here today. Thank you. I want every child, every single child in Louisiana to have the same foundation for learning that Treasure has been able to experience. I want every acorn to grow to become a tall oak. That is why I have proposed $25 million in additional funding for early childhood education in the budget that you'll be working to pass this session. When we talk about education, we were also talking about workforce development. In my inaugural address, I said that I wanted Louisiana to have the most job-ready workforce in the country for a diversified 21st century economy. One way that we're doing this is through our Jobs for America's Graduates program, better known as JAG. JAG Louisiana currently serves 6,000 at-risk youth across the state. Students in the JAG program have a 98% graduation rate. 80% enter full-time jobs, and 90% graduate high school with either a job or a post-secondary education plan. And these are all at-risk students. Sharon Lair is a JAG Louisiana specialist and teacher at Alexandria Middle Magnet. She's an Army veteran, a graduate of Louisiana College and Southern University, and she's an educator. In addition to being a dedicated volunteer in her community, Growing up, Sharon had to overcome many of her own hardships. As a JAG specialist for the past four years, she's been able to use her experiences to connect and engage with young people. And it's because of dedicated teachers and specialists like Sharon that students like Scholar Delaney have found the right network they need to succeed. Before entering JAG, Scholar had a difficult start in life and didn't yet realize his own potential. After three years in JAG, however, Scholar is an honor roll student and was Alexandria Middle Magnet's Student of the Year. And now, as a ninth grader at Bolton High School, he serves as a national JAG speaker, sharing his story with other JAG students across the country. Sharon and Scholar, please stand, and thank you for your contributions. Thank you for being here today. When I became governor, I made a commitment to double the number of JAG programs in the state. We have already accomplished that, and now we have 124 programs, and I'm setting a goal now to get to 200 by the end of this term. Another way we are focusing on workforce development is through the recent creation of the Governor's Advisory Council on Rural Revitalization. As part of this council, we will be addressing everything from better broadband and infrastructure to more opportunities for apprenticeship programs and dual enrollment. And we're going to continue to land major economic development deals, not only in the bigger urban areas, but also in more rural parishes. And in fact, 52 of our 64 parishes have participated in this economic development with the projects that we've won over the last four years. And if you want to know just how important even a small economic development project can be in a rural community, just ask Kelvin Jackson. Kelvin was born and raised in Lake Providence, Louisiana, served in the Navy, and is the single father of three daughters, ages 8, 13, and 14. For years, Kelvin commuted over an hour each way every day. And then, in August of last year, Epic Piping announced the creation of a 50-job pipe fabrication facility at the Port of Lake Providence. 
When compared to larger projects in bigger cities, 50 jobs may not seem like a lot, but in Kelvin's own words, this has lifted the spirits of the community. Today, Kelvin serves as the lead CNC operator for Epic Piping. And above all, he is now able to spend more time at home as a dad. Kelvin, would you please stand and thank you for being here with us today and for sharing your story. And thank you for your service. For our communities in the southern region of the state, coastal restoration is on track to create thousands of new job opportunities, billions of dollars in economic impact. And with the completion of the projects that we will start by the end of this term, we will be creating more land in Louisiana than we are losing. Now, these are all examples of how we are diversifying our economy, creating jobs, and equipping workers with the training they need to fill those jobs. But there's only so much progress we can make if we aren't paying our workers enough to be competitive with other states. Louisiana is one of only five states to not have adopted a state minimum wage. Congress, as you well know, is out of the business. They've made that very clear. It's on us now. It's on all of you in this room. We know what needs to be done. And the people of Louisiana overwhelmingly want it to be done. So let's make this the year that we decide not to fall further behind. So I'm recommending a gradual increase in the minimum wage that will begin with $9 per hour on January the 1st, 2021, and that will move to $10 an hour six months later in July. And I'm also supporting a measure. Thank you. And I'm also supporting a measure to prohibit employers from retaliating against employees who discuss or disclose their salary and bar employers from asking the applicant's salary history as a condition of employment. It's simply unacceptable that Louisiana continues to have the largest gender pay gap in the country. Quite frankly, I'm ashamed of that. All of us should be ashamed. Louisianans want and deserve better. Pay transparency is about preventing anyone, man or woman, from losing their job for simply discussing their salaries. No one should be fired for that. Together, we can change this. And studies show that when there's transparency, there's also more equity. And when it comes to salary history, what a person currently earns or has earned in the past should neither limit nor dictate their future earning potential. Employers can still ask about salary requirements or expectations, and that's fair. But what isn't fair is using a person's salary history as an excuse to not compensate them according to their experience and education. And for women who are often already paid less than their male counterparts, it makes it that much more difficult to bridge the divide. Another way in which we can support both the health and financial stability of families is by improving workplace accommodations for pregnant women. Oftentimes, women who are pregnant will get reassigned to desk duty, or if that's not available, they may lose their jobs altogether. But the reality is that pregnant employees can often continue to do their current duties with just small accommodations, like providing a stool that they can sit on or more frequent breaks. This will not only help support women in the workplace, it will also promote the health of both mom and baby. Which leads me to my next priority this session, the implementation of a maternal mortality review. This will ensure that any hospital or birthing center that has written policies and procedures to investigate any maternal death and to do so in a timely, death, um, timely manner. Louisiana maternal mortality rates exceed the national average, and black women are four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death. This is unacceptable, especially when so many of these deaths are preventable. To that end, the state has already taken steps that have reduced severe blood loss by 30% and high blood pressure by nearly 40% at the time of birth. Importantly, we have made great strides to make sure those gains are shared more equally, reducing the racial gap in those measures by more than 80%. I know that this is an issue we can all agree needs to be addressed, so I'm asking you to join me. 
And in keeping with the theme of putting children and families first, I'm honored to be serving as the co-chair this year for the Administration for Children and Families 2020 Adoption Challenge. This is a national initiative to reduce the number of children in foster care who are waiting for a forever home. In Louisiana, there are currently more than 400 foster children who've been freed for adoption but still need a permanent home. In the past few years, we've made huge strides in increasing the number of adoptions from foster care. Let's make Louisiana an example for the rest of the country by finding a loving home for all children in need. Finally, I want to spend some time talking about something I know is going to be a hot topic this session, the high cost of auto insurance. Let's be clear, auto insurance costs too much in Louisiana, period. That's why I'm supporting a series of bills, all of which are being carried by Senator Jay Luno, that will actually help to lower auto insurance rates for people in Louisiana and prohibit certain arbitrary penalties. Here's a list of factors that auto insurance companies can currently use to legally increase your rates. Your gender, your credit score, losing your spouse, being deployed in the military. I think we can all agree that our auto insurance rates should be based on our driving records, not on if you're female or poor or widowed or putting your life on the line for our country. These bills would prohibit penalties based on those factors. We have 130 guardsmen currently mobilized, and we're about to have nearly 2,000 more deployed by the end of the year. And we should do everything in our power to make sure they are not penalized when they return. Making these changes to avoid discrimination in the setting of insurance rates is the common sense thing to do. But more importantly, it's the right thing to do. If in addition to real insurance reform, you want to pursue other efforts, I am absolutely willing to sit down with you and discuss with a goal of finding common ground. Something else I'm hopeful that we can all find common ground on this year is encouraging all residents to participate in the 2020 Census. Starting this week, information will begin going out to homes on how to participate. We all know that it's vital for everyone to be counted because of the direct impact it has on their lives and on our ability to best serve them. Earlier in my remarks, I mentioned the oak tree at the governor's mansion that bears the phrase, tall oaks from little acorns grow. It is a powerful and accurate way to describe the importance of education. But it also holds true to the work that we do in this building. Progress doesn't happen overnight. It starts with a vision, a dream, or an idea. Sometimes it starts with a single bill. And then over time, what began as a seed of faith will grow as tall and strong as an oak tree, outlasting all of us here today. The people of Louisiana elected us to create positive change that will benefit generations to come. And together, there is no seed we can't sow, especially if we continue to build on the bipartisanship that has served us so well. Despite the obvious challenges that we face, I am as optimistic as ever about the future of this great state. And I look forward to forging new partnerships this session as we enter a new year, a new term, and a new chapter for Louisiana. So God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. And God bless the great state of Louisiana. Thank you. The governor's address to the state legislature as the 2020 session is now underway uh, at the state capitol in Baton Rouge. And Barry Irwin, uh, your initial uh, reaction to what you heard? Well, it wasn't a big sweeping speech with a lot of major initiatives. Um, largely what it seemed to focus on were things that we've kind of heard about before, investments the governor intends to make or would like to make, particularly in education, be it early education, K through 12, and also higher education. Um, and also in some existing programs that we already have. You mentioned the JAG program, some other things like that that, that are to continue to expand those. He hit on the minimum wage, the gender equality gap in terms of pay, um, maternal health, 
Those are all things, or largely things, that we've talked about before. They haven't really gone anywhere mm -hmm. before, but he has continued to bang that drum. So nothing brand new here, but at least you can see his priorities tend to be in the area of investments and budget uh, initiatives. Many of these things seem to be things that would be the key basics to success in general. So uh, you, you might think, well, what's to disagree about some of this stuff? But we know it's not all going to pass. It's but. not. Um, like I say, some of these things we've heard before, particularly on the minimum wage situation, we'll hear that again. But the legislature has been reluctant to, to do that, mm -hmm. and they have been since the outset. Um, one thing you did hear the governor uh, mention was insurance reform. And again, as we mentioned earlier, that's going to be a topic that we're going to be talking a lot about. He has a method uh, of doing that, which he outlined in terms of looking at what he considers some discriminatory um, policies that yeah. insurance companies have. So that's going to be one tact we're going to hear. And the other is going to have to do with civil litigation over these things. So we'll see if the twain shall meet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, it's always interesting and uh, interesting to see the different approaches, the different tones uh, that these talks, these sessions uh, have as they get underway. And uh, we're just at the start of this one. We are, and again, a lot of new faces. I, I thought that there was not a lot of applause for things. Um, people were smiling, as we mentioned, when they came in, but yes. otherwise they kind of kept them to themselves to, to some degree, except for a couple of issues that came up. But I think everybody's kind of feeling each other out here to see how this new leadership, um, new faces, new uh, Republican conservatives in, in place in both houses, how the Democrat governor can relate to those. So um, we'll see how that goes. And of course, uh, uh, today the governor mentioned a 4 p.m. news conference. At right. the state capitol to discuss the first uh, case of a positive uh, case of coronavirus uh, in the state. Right. Uh, so we'll learn more about that. Certainly one that everybody is interested in, and he said it was presumptive, it, it was a positive, sure. but it needs to be confirmed through the various um, sources that they go through. But as he said before, it's not when, it's if. I mean, not if, it's when. Yes, right. And the when may be here now, certainly. I mean, we've seen this spread in other states and uh, yeah. Jefferson Parish is where this one seems yeah, to be. Yeah, a lot of impact uh, all over the pl place. Um, um, and also the caution to not just be fearful right. for the sake of being fearful. Well, and I think you when really you don't see that. the markets plunge and the yeah, oil prices it's, plunge it's and tough. concerns about travel, people yes. start to get that way. But I mean, I think you're going to continue to hear good common sense um, responses to this from the governor and hopefully from other elected officials as well. All right, Barry, everyone, thanks so much for being with us today. Great. Uh, and uh, our appreciation also to Natasha Williams. And uh, we'll send you back to regular programming now. Thank you for joining us as the Louisiana Legislature opens its 2020 session. I'm Andre Morrow. We'll see you this Friday on The State Brand. with the animals, Leo. Me too! Did you see that awesome moose, Luna? Luna? Here I am! Luna, thank you for your help today. I wish I...